Movies are our frame of reference for what we're talking about. I, I'm going to tell you, look at movies to become a better speaker, because I think people forget that these are not radio broadcasts. Presentations are not radio broadcasts. You watch the King speech, he's talking into a microphone the entire time. People can't see him and respond to what he's doing. But when you're giving a speech, people are looking at you and they're listening to how you speak, right? So you've got to consider the entire package. I think that's why movies are the best frame of reference. My goal is to get through this next part of the presentation relatively quickly so that I can leave some time for any questions people may have. And surely you, you all have some questions. At least if you don't now, hopefully you will by the time we're finished. There's a particular type of movie, there's a particular type of story that I think people really, really love, especially in this culture. When I say this culture, I'm talking about the Western Hemisphere for the most part. Because when you're talking in the United States, when you're talking to Toastmasters, that's generally speaking the majority of your audience. They're going to be part of that culture or they will have lived in that part of the world for a long time. In the Western Hemisphere, and I think this is true around the entire world, I think people love love stories in particular. And when you think of love stories, this is probably one of the first movies that comes to mind, right? The Titanic. I remember the scene, and I almost used it, but I feel like it's too obvious where they're in the front of the boat, and they're singing near, far. And you, you know. You know how it ends. The ship is going to sink. One of them, after that scene, cannot make it off the ship, right? And yet you still love watching the movie. Whether you deny it or not, you saw it at least, and most of us liked it. Notebook comes to mind. Never thought kissing in the rain could be so awesome. So you saw the notebook. I still don't know why this is considered a romantic comedy. <laughs> I work at the courthouse. I've seen prostitution cases. They don't look anything remotely close to Pretty Woman. But it worked. I guess that's good storytelling. Greatest love story of all time? <laughs> but here's something I want you to ask yourself. What is it that makes these movies work? And don't say the obvious, right? The fact that they're focused on a relationship. Because I'm going to ask you this question. Consider My Fair Lady, for those of you who saw it. The main characters never kiss. I don't even think they hug during the movie. I don't know if they have any physical contact at all. But would you question me if I said it's a love story? If you take the kissing and the sex and everything else they put in the movies out and you just have this relationship, aside from the kissing and everything else that goes along with it, is the nature of the storytelling any different? Let's have a, let's have a bigger stretch. And I know this slide is dark, but still, this is a lost genre and I love it. Action comedy, 48 hours, Nick Nolte and Eddie Murphy. Again, you take the kissing out. <laughs> Do they not bicker like an old married couple? Do they not help each other out like an old married couple? Are they behaving any differently towards each other in terms of the way the story is told? And I want you to think through how they meet in the movie, <laughs> what they're doing in the movie. Lethal Weapon is the same story. The, the way the relationship connects they fight just as much as the couple in the notebook fights, if you think about it. And it doesn't have to be two guys. <laughs> this was one of the first movies I saw that just really made me connect emotionally was E.T. A boy and an alien is a love story. A boy and a whale is a love story. Two women together can be a love story, like Thelma Louise. Like an plat otherwise platonic relationship can be a love story. And you may not think of this as being a love story, but the blind side was definitely that, was it not? Let me ask you a question. If you went to buy the book that this movie is based on, what part of the bookstore would you expect to find this book in? Sports? Nonfiction. Made into a movie. Made into a movie. That'd be the awesome, that'd be the perfect <laughs> section, right? <laughs> Made into a movie. People normally say nonfiction. I had several people this time say sports. It actually is in the sports section because it's a basically a biography of the left offensive tackle position. But to tell the story, the person who wrote the book realized, I need to pick one particular player and tell his story, the perfect player for this position to make this clear. And the relationship he has with the woman played by Sandra Bullock, I don't remember her real name, is a big part of that story. Tui. Say it again? Sandra Tui. Sandra Tui. Something like that. <laughs> if you read the book, the story is even, her, her part of the story is even more awesome than it is in the movie. But the bigger issue here is someone realized 
If I tell a story about one player, I'll have a great sports book. Somebody read the book and said, we could make an entire movie just about this one relationship. It's the relationship that is the selling point. And so you have to stop and ask yourself, why does that work? Why can the relationship even be an effective selling point? And it's because of the feeling that's generated by the relationship. And you may not realize it, but part of what you're thinking when you watch these movies is, oh man, I, my mom was like that. Even if your mom wasn't like that, it's what you're thinking, right? Because you wanted to have a mom that was like that. And it makes you connect with the movie. When you stand up and you tell a personal story that helps the jurors connect, let me give you a specific example. I dealt with lots of sexual assault cases in the assignment that I previously had with the DA's office. It's really hard to explain why rape victims do some of the things that they do. If a woman gets raped and then the attacker leaves her and goes and makes himself a sandwich in the other room, some people have a hard time understanding, well, why don't she just get up and run out of the room? Could it really have happened that way if she didn't just get up and run outside of the room? And I talk to people about violence and the cycle of violence and what I see on these cases. I try to give them facts. I try to use logic. I felt like it always failed. And one day, on a whim, I told a jury, you know what, when I was growing up, my grandfather used to take me to the circus. And I'd see this big, huge elephant chained to the ground by a little chain and a stake. And I'm not saying this is right or wrong, just saying I saw it. And I'd ask him, why doesn't the elephant just yank the stake up and run off? There's nothing stopping it. He said, well, when it's a baby elephant, it tries. They put a stake in the ground, they tie it to the stake, and it does try to get up and pull the stake out, but it can't. And then as the elephant grows, they put a bigger and bigger shackle around its ankle, and they keep it tied in the ground with the same stake. But at some point, that elephant forgets that now it's a big, strong elephant and not a baby elephant anymore. And it just stops trying, and it just stays there. And I'd say, folks, that's what it's like for so-and-so in this case, because I don't use real people's names when I'm repeating stories. And the jury connects to those stories. They connect in part because they like the idea of me telling a story about my grandfather. They like to think that says something about their own childhood. They like the fact that it's a basic common sense example that relies on a specific feeling that gets them where I need them to be in terms of what it is I'm trying to communicate. And if you watch commercials, if you watch TV shows, I challenge you to sit and watch an hour of TV on any given station and then ask yourself how many of the stories or shows or commercials you watch did not sell something, if only the show, by focusing on relationships. Why do you think Oprah Winfrey did so well? Is focus on relationships, positive, healthy relationships of different forms. People love this because of the feeling that it generates that, oh, it's just so sweet. When I was watching E.T., E.T. was a botanist. Again, I'm dating myself. We'll see who grew up in the 80s. Every, surely everybody's seen this movie, and if you haven't, this is your homework. You have to watch E.T. E.T. <laughs> e. was a botanist. And you could tell how E.T. was doing based on how the plants around him were doing. And he had this one potted plant that he was attached to. And there's this scene where the government comes in, they take E.T., and they're going to study E.T., they start connecting E.T. to all these cords and wires, and they show the plant, and the plant is just dwindling, 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 and then it shrivels. And I remember as a little boy watching that movie, I was about to cry for the first time in the movie. The tear was about to start trickling. And then as soon as it was right about to come out of my eye, the plant blossoms. And you hear that theme music, that ba da 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 And I was like, yes! <laughs> and your mom's like, shh, I can't help it. E.T.'s okay, it's okay. <laughs> That's what people love about these stories. Now, when you sit down to write your own story in this context, it helps to know who the characters need to be in the story. Now, you may not have thought about Men in Black as a love story, but I would say it's basically that. You've got the main character, played by Will Smith, Tommy Lee Jones is his buddy. It's a buddy love story. They're doing something together like trying to save the universe. There's a bad guy who's trying to stop him. Think back to the speech that I gave earlier. Who's the bad guy in that speech? The cancer. It doesn't have to be a person, or I don't think this is a person, a humanoid. <laughs> but it's something. Maybe it's a problem that your company is going to face in the next quarter. The bad guy can be that. Maybe the relationships you're focused on or the teammates that you're working with to try to combat that problem. But the bottom line is, there has to be a problem. Mike Carr's speech, 
He was his own problem, and that necklace that he gave to his <laughs> wife, right? His thoughtlessness. That is the problem, though. What people forget about these speeches, and this is one of the things that I loved about Mike's speech, there has to be a mentor in the story. When I tell people, tell stories when he gives speeches, everybody nods like, oh, yeah, yeah, tell stories, tell stories. And then when I hear their speeches, I don't hear stories. And then the few times when I do hear stories, the stories are not coherent. They don't fit together the way a story is supposed to fit together. The reason why you need a mentor is because at some point, the hero is going to be lost. Actually, let me stop saying hero. The main character is going to be lost. And the mentor has to figure out how to help them find their way, him or her find his or her way. And Mike Carr's speeches, and this is another thing that I liked about his speeches. If you want to be a more effective communicator, if you really want to be good at this, you're going to have to invest a lot of time into thinking about what you believe life is about. I challenge you to think of a great speaker who did not invest a lot of time into thinking about what they believe life is about. Do you think Martin Luther King Jr. spent a couple of minutes thinking about that, what he thought the point of life is? How about Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill, Barbara Jordan? All these people had some philosophy that guided their train of thought, something they were consistently trying to communicate to other people. Charles Dickens, how many of his stories are basically about an orphan trying to find their way? Over and over again, some of the most memorable books of all time. And I noticed that about Mike Carr's speeches. They both involved his family. What I noticed in particular was the mentor in both speeches was his wife. She stepped in and said what needs to happen in order to fix the problem, right? That tells me he's matured as a storyteller and that he has a framework for where he's trying to go with his stories. And you need to be the same way when you're developing yours. And we've already talked about this, but there has to be a problem in the speech. Otherwise, what is the point in giving a speech? People don't want to hear speeches for the sake of hearing speeches. Communication exists for the purpose of solving problems and enjoying the relationships that we share with each other. There's no other purpose for giving a speech. There's no other purpose for communication. You're either trying to fix a problem or you're celebrating the beauty of life. Otherwise, you need, to, you need to stop and ask yourself if you need to be saying whatever it is that you're saying and whether or not you can reasonably expect people to listen. Now, if you accept that, that it has to be about a problem, it has to be about a problem that people actually experience. I think a movie that covers this really well is Unforgiven. How many of us wish that we could simply be different? Most of us weren't gunslingers in the Old West who are trying to stop killing people. But we are trying to put our old habits aside. And that's basically what Clint Eastwood's trying to do in this movie. He lives out on a rundown ranch, and he's trying to move on. It's also a love story, if you think about it really carefully. Because his old partner comes around one day. Actually, somebody comes around looking for Clint Eastwood. And he goes and he finds his old partner. He says, you know what? There's just one last job we could do. The guy deserves it. He's got it coming. Maybe we go and we do this job, and then we're done. We've got enough money, and then we'll just be done. And like any plan, things go terribly, terribly wrong. And because you know Clint Eastwood is trying to no longer be a gunfighter, it's going to come down to him being a gunfighter in the final scene of the movie, right? <laughs> There's something I love about this scene, and I'm going to stop to put it in perspective. We always talk about pausing when we give our speeches. I'm going to tell you right now, it is scientifically impossible for someone to talk too fast. I believe it's impossible to talk too fast. As somebody who used to be told that I talk too fast. What you can fail to do is pause the right way at the right times, though. And sometimes it helps me to know that the professionals get this wrong, too. Because in this scene, when Clint Eastwood walks into the bar, and if you haven't seen the movie, I'm sorry, you've had more than 10 years to go see it. <laughs> and it'll still be awesome when you see it now. But they kill his friend, and they put his friend on display outside this bar. And so this is the scene when he walks into the bar. And he goes, who's the fella who owns this? Boop. I can't say it in Toastmasters. <laughs> and then the guy steps forward, he's like, that would be me. I'm Greeley. I bought this place back in, and he levels his gun, and he goes, you boys might want to clear out of there. And he shoots him, and he kills him. And then Gene Hackman goes, you sir are cowardly blankety blank. You just shot an unarmed man. And Eastwood goes, well, he should have armed himself. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody in the theater laughed. Because I watched these movies over and over and over again, 
I know that if you listen to what he says next, while everybody's laughing, he says, well, he should have armed himself if he's going to decorate his bar with my friend. And I know they meant for people to hear that part, but you missed it because you didn't know the audience was going to laugh. It may not seem like it, but this slide is actually here to demonstrate a principle. When you're writing your speech, your speech is a rough draft until when? When is it no longer a rough draft? When you give it. Why, though? Why? It's actually still a rough draft the first time or two you give it because you don't know how the audience is going to respond or where they're going to respond that way. The movie Jaws, there's a scene where they're throwing, I think you call it chum, into the water to attract the shark, and the sheriff jumps back. They're like, what's wrong? And he goes, we need a bigger boat. <laughs> and everybody laughs. They didn't know people were going to laugh right there. And after they realized people are going to laugh here, they went back, they put a pause in, they raised the volume. I read this in a book called Blockbuster. <laughs> but your audience response is they're part of the speech. But the bigger principle we were working on is the fact that there's got to be a story with a problem that you're telling that people can relate to. It's got to be a problem that your audience actually cares about being solved for your story to really work. We're going to break this down minute by minute. One of the most important points of your speech is the first minute of your speech where you basically have two goals. Number one, you have to deliver your message. Whatever it is you're talking about, you have to say in the first minute of your speech. You also have to provide a snapshot of what your story entails in the first minute of your speech. My pet peeve about the speech contest. The one thing I hate to hear people say about the speech contest is, so-and-so would have won if they just hadn't gone over time. As somebody who entered the contest and worked really hard at the contest, you didn't win if you went over time. And I'm about to demonstrate it to you. I need two people who've got cell phones with timers on them. I have two volunteers. All right, I've got a young lady here in the front. I've got somebody in the back. All right, once you get your timers up, I'm going to pause. Then I'm going to start talking. And when I say time, I want you to hit your timers. <clears throat> so let me know when you're ready. Are you ready? Ready in the back? Okay. Let me know when you're ready. <clears throat> the best doctor in the whole wide world does more than stitch up cuts, push pills, and take out tonsils. He gives people hope. Fellow Toastmasters, hope is the best medicine. Because you can't always cure people, but you can give them strength to push on, and that's what hope does. It gives you strength even when you're dying. Hit your timer, but don't tell me how much time yet. Now, before I ask them, can we agree I'm speaking at a comfortable pace? Yeah. Can we agree that basically summarizes what the content of the speech is? Anybody disagree with me on that? Okay. In the front, how much time? 20 seconds. In the back? 20.1 20 .1 seconds. All right. Reset your timers for me. <clears throat> you guys ready? Miss Mamo was obviously dying. She had lots of tubes, tubes to her wrist, tubes to her nose, tubes to this big machine that went doop, doop. She had thick, beautiful hair once, but it was all gone. And so were all the relationships that she took for granted. Now she accepted dying from cancer because she had to, but nobody can accept dying alone without hope, and they don't have to. They just need help from the best doctor in the whole wide world. Hit your timers. Don't tell me the time yet. Does everybody agree I was speaking at a reasonable pace? I don't want to be accused of blah, 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 like going too fast. I'm speaking at a reasonable pace. Does everybody agree that basically summarizes the content of the story you're about to hear? All right. In the front, how much time? 31 seconds. In the back? 31.9 seconds. You can do it in a minute. That's why when people say, oh, so-and-so would have won, they just came in at 8 minutes instead of 7.30, they came in at like 750 instead of 725. They didn't win. If you go over time, you didn't win. In an extra 20 seconds, an extra 30 seconds, if you know how to write a speech well, which is why we're talking about this, you can write a completely different speech. Would you agree with like one 20-minute segment like that? You can tell a totally different story. You can tell something you didn't really have time to put in perspective for the audience. But your writing has to be effective. And let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you straight up. People who are good at writing, they judge you for your writing. 
They may not tell you, but they, am I wrong? Because I know you're a good writer. Cindy's a good writer. Do you judge people when they send you an email? It's got grammatical errors and it's structurally. <laughs> they judge your employers, the people at the top of your company. They know how to write well. They judge you for those emails that you send. You can't tell how many people I talk to like, I don't need to be a Toastmaster. I text. That's how I communicate. People are judging you for your texts. <laughs> you may not realize they are judging you. Your writing has to be tight and concise and clear. And you have to toil and toil and toil until you can do that in the first minute of your speech. I'll tell you one more thing to put this in perspective. After I won the world championship, I was saying what lots of Toastmasters say, well, nobody gives five to seven minute speeches. And I'm telling this to my oldest brother. I'm like, man, nobody's ever going to pay me for a five to seven minute speech. And he's being quiet on the other end of the phone. And I know what he's thinking. He's thinking something that disagrees with what I'm saying. <laughs> and I told him, you have to agree with me. No one cares about a five to seven minute speech. You know what his response was? I wouldn't pay you for a five to seven minute speech. I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, I tell people if you're trying to sell something and you can't do it in 30 seconds, you can't do it. When I'm standing up in front of a judge, do you think the judge gives me five to seven minutes to get to the point of what I'm saying? I have like 10 or 15 seconds to be able to summarize it. If I have to walk up to somebody and give an elevator pitch for something, do you think they're going to give me five to seven minutes before I get to the point? You have 30 seconds tops. I didn't know this was an official rule, but in the world of speaking, it is. I just knew when I was competing, after the contest, Josephine would ask me, what would you think of so-and-so? I said, I really wasn't listening. Like, what do you mean? Man, I've never spot my own speech. I wasn't listening to their speech. She's like, well, how do you, you remembered such and such a speech? I'm like, 30 seconds in, I can tell if I'm in trouble or not. And if I don't think I'm in trouble 30 seconds in, I stop listening. And I was never wrong, not a single time. Every time I lost, I could tell 30 seconds into their speech, I was in trouble. Every time I said, I don't have anything to worry about, I was right every <laughs> single time, even before I really had a sense of what I was doing. Now, the second part of the presentation of your speech, broken down minute by minute, I call the comedic first encounter. My example of this will always be the fox and the hound. Again, if you have not seen this, Disney sometimes limits when their movies are available, but you need to get your hands on it and see it. They're chasing the fox. I don't even know if the fox realizes this, but he's being hunted by some hound dogs. And one little hound dog gets separated from the pack, and the fox finds him, and he peeks over the log, and he's like, what are you? He goes, I'm a hound dog. <laughs> it's a cute scene. I don't know why people like individuals that can make them laugh, but I know they do. Think back on the speech that you heard. Where does a comedic first encounter happen in the speech? The one that I gave. Where's a comedic first encounter? Yeah, I'm the, a little boy walks in to meet Miss Mamo, right? Here's, here's what people don't understand. All the reasons why contestants complain about the speech contest and the unfortunate truth about the speech contest is it brings out the best and the worst in Toastmasters. Because you've got people that are scared to death, which I was to enter the contest, and you've got people who think they know everything about the contest and don't hesitate to tell you everything about the contest. <laughs> and the problem is I found very few people actually took the time to figure out how communication works. I was scared to death the first time I was invited to give a keynote after I won the world championship. Because I'm thinking to myself, a week ago, I was scared to say anything. I was scared that I was going to get laughed off the stage. And now you're asking me to tell you how I did it. I'm like, I'm going to look so stupid when I stand up there and tell these people some of these things. And people will come up and say, oh, it's the best presentation I heard. Excuse me for making myself the hero. But I felt good about it. <laughs> I felt so good about it. Because I'm sitting there listening like, oh, you did this so well. I'm like, really, really? Did I? Did I really? It's good to hear that. Because I don't think I knew what I was talking about. But most people never took the time to ask, why are you supposed to do things that people are telling you to do? And I think the reason why I was able to do it is because I'm not a natural communicator. I firmly believe anybody can win the district level of the contest if you want to. And I break the speech contest into three categories. Your club level up to division, I think, is one category. I would include district in that, but district has a microphone, and I think that makes things different. So district, and in District 55, the semifinals, I put in their own category. The good thing about District 55 is if you can win this district, you can win the semifinals. And then the finals, they're their own special category. I'm talking mainly today about the first phase of the contest. Anybody can win that phase of the contest. Anybody try that book, Strength Finders 2.0? 
I, 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 a few people have done it. You take this test, it tells you what your strengths are. I won the world championship of public speaking. What is going to be one of my strengths if communication is a strength? What would you think would be one of my strengths? Communication, communication is not one of my strengths. <laughs> it was not one of my, I was going to write a letter, I want a speech contest. I'm like, am I, am I a bad speaker? But you know what my first one was? Individualization. Individualization is described as the ability to know what's important to other people. I think you noticed that theme in what I'm telling you about communication. And I said all this to get to one particular point. Everybody says in the speech contest, you have to be funny. You have to make people laugh. But no one ever says why it's important to be funny, do they? You have five to seven minutes to get your audience emotionally invested in what you're about to tell them. Don't ask me why, but humor is the fastest way to do it. If you can make people laugh about a relationship, make people laugh about you in the context of a relationship, for whatever reason, people are hooked. That's just the way it works. Both Mike Carr's speeches work that way. Just something funny, the guy panicking about his wife having a baby, and you're laughing about it, and you don't stop to think about why you care, but you do care about the outcome. And a lot of famous comedians have done that. Bill Cosby himself, he has a whole scene about being there while his wife is having a baby. And I, I call that the comedic first encounter, and it takes place in minutes basically two through four of your speech. And if you'll watch movies, if you read books, I think what you'll notice is a lot of them follow a basic format like this. Another thing people tend not to understand about storytelling, I think Mike Carr understands it very well. There is a problem, otherwise you wouldn't be giving a speech. The person with the problem has to get over the problem by the end of the speech. I can't tell you how many speeches I've heard where there's a problem at the beginning of the speech, and at the end of the speech, the same problem still exists at the end of the speech. Now, if it's entertaining enough, it doesn't matter. I remember my dad used to love All in the Family <laughs> growing up. Archie Bunker never solved any of his problems. Same problem at the end of every episode that he had at the beginning of every episode. George Jefferson was the same way. Wheezy's problems would get solved, but George's never did. <laughs> but the person in your story has to adapt and triumph by the end of the speech. And even, I started off saying one of the most important parts of the speech is the first minute of the speech. It is not the most important part of the speech. The most important part of your speech is the end of your speech. The most important part of, the mo of a movie is the end of a movie. Most important part of a book is the end of the book. And if you doubt me, ask yourself this. How many times have you been watching a movie and it seems like it's a great movie? And then you get to the end, you're like, what? <laughs> Seriously? Seriously, that's how this ends? Man, this is terrible. I love the movie Silver Linings Playbook. <laughs> have y'all seen that movie? He, uh, he's reading Hemingway, and he's reading it because he's trying to connect with his, with his wife he's estranged from. And then when he finishes the book, he throws it out the window and he wakes his family up in the middle of the night. He's like, he goes through all that, and then he dies. At the end of the book, he dies. That's how it ends, and it ruins the whole thing. I want you to think back on Karate Kid. You got this kid who's being bullied. This is when they should have started advertising about bullying, back during Karate Kid. He's being bullied badly. Like, he's being karate chopped every day when he walks down the hallways, right? <laughs> There's no future for him at this high school. Then he meets this mentor who teaches him karate, and it ends. First, it looks like, He's never going to be able to enter these fights. Then he's entering the fights and he's doing well. And you remember that line, sweep the leg. What? Sweep the leg. <laughs> if y'all haven't seen this movie, you've got to watch this movie. <laughs> how can I teach you how to be better communicators if you don't watch the movie as necessary <laughs> for me to do it? So they sweep Daniel's leg and they hurt his leg. And then he thinks, oh my gosh, I can't finish the final round. And then he comes back out and you're like, how? yeah, I know, exactly. Mr. Miyagi starts rubbing his hands. How's this going to end? How's it going to work? And he's like, I, can only, I only have one leg. I can only fight off one leg. So he stands on one leg, and he does that awesome kick, and everybody was like, yes. I remember, I remember we were walking out of, the, out of the theater. My middle brother and I and my mom were walking out of the theater. My mom turns and says, I'm signing all of you up for karate lessons next week. <laughs> <laughs> it's so perfect. It seemed like life would be better because of that. But the main issue, again, is in the first minute, You've got two goals, your message and a snapshot of where the story is headed. There's a point I want to make, and I was talking to Mike Carr about it, and I want you to think about this. There's a reason why we watch movie previews before we go see the movie. There's an entire art to making a movie preview. 
part of it is to orient the audience. One, you want to get people pumped up and say, ooh, Brad Pitt's in this movie. Or whatever the guy who plays Thor is, if he's in a movie, Josephine wants to go see it. <laughs> they had the biggest argument about who was the coolest Avenger. I still say it's Iron Man with the cloak. The Hulk is a close second. Thank you. She's like Thor all the way. I'm like, you are crazy. <laughs> but they want you to know things like that. They also want you to have perspective on where the story is headed. That's what a snapshot is. Because people argue, I don't want to give my story away. You're not giving it away. You're providing context for what you're about to say. You read the back cover of a book for the same reason. Not the back page, not the back page, <laughs> but the back cover. Ultimate example, the New York Times, whether you like the New York Times or not, is not important. There's a book review every week, every Sunday in the New York Times. They summarize an entire book with a single sentence. And I think the sentences are actually dead on, as much as a single sentence could be. You have to learn how to summarize where you're headed, because whether you realize it or not, People are frustrated with you because you're not doing this right now. They're like, okay, what's the point, right? People stop listening to you until you get there. I just want to make sure that's clear for everybody because part of that, part of that in the speech contest is the title of your speech. Everybody said I took a big risk by wearing a costume. You know what my response is? There are six elimination rounds to the contest. Each one gets a little bit harder than the one before it. How many times have you seen something work five times in a row and called it a risk? The only reason for you calling it a risk if you admit that it worked five times in a row is that you haven't seen it before. That's not a good reason for saying that something's a risk, is it? It oriented the audience to what they're about to hear. You see a guy in a doctor's coat with some Fisher Price lab kit. I don't have to explain that much once the story gets started. But I think that's advanced. Start off wearing a suit in the contest. Take my advice on that. Then again, your comedic first encounter, what's happening minutes two through four. Last part of the story is adaptation and triumph. One of these days, I'm going to do a presentation that's based solely on how to end the story because I think people's endings always fall apart. They always fall apart. I'll still remember the ultimate example for me of an ending falling apart was table topics contest. This guy tells a story said he's proposing to his wife. He has one real ring and one fake ring. He takes her up to a cliff, and he kneels down, and he gives her the fake ring. And she, this is not, a, this is not your story, Mike Carr. I'm not telling. <laughs> <laughs> your necklace story would have been awesome ending if it was like this. He shows her the fake ring. And then, and then she's excited because she wants to marry him. He takes the ring, and he throws it out uh, off the cliff. And she's like, what are, you, what are you doing? And he's like, aha, here's the real ring. And I'm thinking inside my head, every woman in the audience hates you right now. That's a terrible story. Josephine's like, that's a terrible story. I don't like this story. If you were to give that story a good ending, and I don't know if it obviously didn't happen this way, a good ending to that story would have been, you do the exact same insensitive thing. You walk up there, you throw the ring off the cliff, but you threw the right ring off the cliff. <laughs> and then you turn back with the fake ring, and you say that she told you, sweetheart, I love you with all of my heart, and of course I want to marry you just as soon as you go down there and find my ring. <laughs> <laughs> and the key with an ending is you didn't see it coming, but the story couldn't have ended any other way. I can't tell you how to do it. I can just tell you that's it. You didn't see it coming, but it couldn't have ended any other way. I always tell you that I'm not the only person who uses these ideas. One of the best commercials of all time, I love it. The little boy dressed up like Darth Vader. You Remember this commercial? He's up in his bedroom trying to use the force on one of his sister's dolls, and it doesn't work. Then dad comes home, and dad goes in the kitchen. He's talking to mom. Little boy runs out to the car. He's doing this in front of the car, and the car turns on. And I know this look because I gave it to my mom so many times. The car turns on. He jumps, and he looks like, Mom, are you looking? Did you see this? And then, and then you're kind of like, how, how did he do that? And they flash to dad, and he's got the remote <laughs> key, and he just looks at mom, and he pops his eyebrows. You don't see that coming. But it really, the Audi commercial couldn't have ended any other way. Ultimate movie example is The Sixth Sense. And he has not been able to replicate that sense. But that's how a story needs to end. And that's also kind of a love story, to tell you the truth. It's kind of a, a love story slash monster story. But I, I think it, a lot of it focuses on his relationship with his counselor. But that's the key to an effective ending when you're giving a story. And you'll know you did it well because people will come up to you and they'll tell you about their own personal experiences. When they're complimenting your speech, 
They won't say, oh, Mike Carr, I thought that was an awesome speech. They'll say, you know, once I really messed up, you know, in my relationship, and your story took me right back there, and I hope I can have an ending like yours, because that's what stories do. You tell your story, which is a subjective experience that you are trying to make universal. And if you do it properly, at some point when people are listening to you and laughing at you and thinking about you, they put their own story on top of what you're talking about, and that's what they're thinking about and feeling the rest of the way through your presentation. And that's how you know when you're doing it right. I have an email from a man out in California who told me that he lost his daughter in a car crash, and he always felt guilty that he couldn't be there. But he said that when he listened to my speech that I gave at the finals, it made him feel like things were in God's hands, not his, and everything would be okay. And that's what he came up and talked to me about at the end of my presentation. And that's how I knew the speech was where I wanted it to be. Now, I tried to plan time for a few questions. Maybe we can take at least a couple. Anybody have a burning question? Yes, sir. I, I think, you know, I got some good ideas of speech writing and everything, and I write them down. Good. And with Mike Carr, I see that he uses the stage quite a bit. And mm -hmm. He kind of moves around, and you kind of stay center and move just a little bit. Mm -hmm. My question is, how do you know when that's too much? Obviously, it works for Mike Carr. Mm -hmm. but I don't know if it would work for me. R remember, remember what I told you is your focus. You start off with a feeling, then the only question you answer in each stage is, how do I make this feeling more real? If making the feeling more real requires you to run across the stage, then you need to do it. And when Mike Carr was talking about the emotion at the beginning of his speech and he's running around, that's how he felt inside. And I think that his movement managed to generate that. Me. I think that you see a lot of people and they'll just kind of do like this when they're talking. And sometimes I'll, I'll wonder like, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> like, where are you? They, they will, they'll, they'll just, they'll, like some people, they're just walking around and there's no reason for them to be walking around. The only people I see do that where it makes sense, Chris Rock will do that, like he'll pace a lot when he's talking, but I think he wants you to have that nervous energy while you're listening to parts of it. Yeah, move it so I, I would say that that's the question you've got to ask. There's another important point, and Josephine, who is my speech coach, pointed this out. Mike Carr and I were talking after his speeches, and he said that one of the champs was telling him, yeah, you should tone down the emotion. I actually talked to the same person. I won't say their name, because they're a great speaker, just have a different style. I actually talked to this person about what my ideas were for the speech contest, and I think they thought I was crazy, like insane. And if they'd seen any part of my speech, they'd been like, yeah, turn that volume way, way, way down. There's a consequence to moving around and being animated, and that is you have to fully commit to it. If you're going to say, oh, I ran over, you have to say, ooh, and run over. You can't be like, oh, I ran over. It, then that just looks weird. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> you have to be able to fully commit to the emotion, and you're probably not going to be able to do that until you've made like a complete idiot out of yourself a couple of times, and then you'll relax about it. But I, I say that because the last piece of advice I'd give you when you're trying to figure out how to be animated, how to move around, find a comedian that you really like, and imitate them doing what they do until you can get the same types of responses. And what you're going to quickly find is they move around a lot more than you realize, even the ones that seem very, very subdued. They move around a lot. They vary their voice a lot. If I were to make you come up and do parts of my speech where it seems like I'm not moving that much, I think you'd feel really self-conscious even doing those small parts. But again, it's focused on communicating an emotion without having to explain what you're doing. That was a long answer, but does it make sense what I'm telling you? It makes <coughs> sense. I think, think sometimes I have a fear of moving around too much. And, and mm -hmm. that is an audience viewing that that might be a little bit distracting to the reader. But you just said the point. If your movement is distracting, it's not effective, and you don't need to be moving. And you know, yeah, I'm going to know that as you practice it. Yeah. And have people tell you, why are you walking around so much? I can't really focus on what you're supposed to be saying. Lawyers do that when they're in front of the jury. Like a lot of lawyers will do this. And they think what they're doing is making contact with each individual member of the jury. And you just look like a pacing tiger the whole time. Because <laughs> I, I used to do that. And one of my mentors said, you can just stand there and look at them from where you're standing. And it works a lot better. And then if you want to say, then she raced into the room, then you can move at that point. But if it's distracting from the purpose of what you're saying, it's distracting and you should stop doing it. Yes, I think her hand went up slightly faster than yours. One of the tips that mm. I got was don't be your own hero. Mm -hmm. So I like to have your thought about that too. Sure. Let me give you 
the ultimate example for this for me. There is a gentleman who sent me a speech. I think he was from Saudi Arabia. What was the question? Uh, I'm sorry. The question was, part of the advice was, don't make yourself the hero of your speech. She wants to hear me comment more on that. People don't want to hear a speech about how awesome you are. At whatever level, that turns people off. You just don't, people just don't like hearing that, unless the context is specific enough. And I think this is hard for some people to understand. I talked to someone once who wrote a speech about a health condition that he had that confines him to a wheelchair. And it will lead to a very early death, and there's nothing he can do to change that. And he wrote a speech, and his speech only talked about him dying soon and how awful his death would be and how he found a way to overcome it. And I told him in my response, you're generating emotion, but it's the wrong kind of emotion. People simply feel bad about your circumstances. And the only thing you're giving them is the fact that you've overcome these individual circumstances. And I think that speech would work if you were talking to a group of people who have the exact same health problem that you do, or a combined group of people with this health problem and people who have loved ones who have this health problem. They would like solely to know that you found a way to adjust and live your life. A more mixed audience needs to hear more than that. They want to hear something positive that came out of this. And my advice to him is instead of talking about all the great things you've done for yourself that have helped you adjust to your life, you could tell a speech, and Mike Carr's stories do this, both of them do, about a relationship, like your relationship with your parents. Talk about how much your parents looked forward to you being born, how hurt they were when they realized you were born with a significant health condition. Not because they don't love you, but because they know how hard life is, and they know now you've got this extra issue you've got to deal with in life, and they're wondering how you're going to manage to do that. And then you talk about how you've overcome the expectations they had independent of the hurdle you have to overcome. And you're talking about yourself and all the great things you've done, but it seems like you're talking about this wonderful relationship, and people find meaning in that. It always works if you're not the hero, if somebody else is the hero in your speech. Think about the speech I told you about me playing doctor. If, if I was a hero at any level, I really didn't even know it, right? My mom forgiving her mom is a hero in that speech. She's the person that had the strength to make everything okay. I was just kind of biding time until the end came, right? That, that's what I mean. Does it answer your question? Yes, thank you. Cindy. Ah. Oh, this is a writer question. I got a writer asking a question. Actually, it's not about that. I, I do write well, but hmm? I screwed up when I did a speech. Uh, and I tend to forget. And hmm. so I was getting ready to do a speech, and I forgot that I was going to do a speech. Yeah. Question. Keep trying. <laughs> So, sometimes there are tricks that you can use. Oh, I'm sorry, let me repeat the question. Cindy said that her difficulty is getting through the speech. She memorizes the speech, she practices giving the speech, she gets up there to give the speech, and she just freezes up. One of my favorite questions to ask people about public speaking is, are you scared? And some, sometimes people are like, I'm terrified. Just as many people say, I'm not scared at all. No. I'm like, okay, well, you should be. <laughs> <laughs> There's that scene from Star Wars when Luke Skywalker says, I'm not afraid. And Yoda, Yoda looks at him and goes, you will be. You will. That's how public speaking is. If you're not scared, it's because it doesn't really matter or you're arrogant. Like if you're excited, if you're single, you're excited about asking somebody out. If you're not scared, you should reconsider whether or not you should ask them out. If they're coming to ask you and you're not scared, you should reconsider saying yes. When you're giving that presentation in front of your boss, you're scared. When I'm standing up in court looking at the six-year-old who's got nobody in her life but me right now, I'm scared about what the jury's going to do. Some things you can only get through by forcing yourself to go through it over and over again. I used to be scared to death of crying. Up until this past summer, I was still, still scared to death of crying. I still didn't have a, I signed up for acting lessons thinking I could learn to act so well, I could make it seem like I wasn't crying at all whenever I felt like it. I failed repeatedly, failed. And the person I was paying for acting lessons was like, you know, I really don't think this is a problem. You won a speech contest. I think you're a pretty good public speaker. You shouldn't be worried about this anymore. But the difficulty is, and this is why your question is so important, that's what an insecurity is. It doesn't matter what other people tell you. It matters how you feel inside. Until you can deal with the way you feel inside, it doesn't matter how great what you have to say is, how well you can say it once you get the words out, 
You simply have to figure out how to make that happen. And I think that's a very unique personal experience, but I think I can give you a clue about how to get started. And this is what my coach told me to do. Write an oral history for yourself. Go back and think through all the experiences that you had. I know you had a stumbling block at a bar mitzvah years and years ago, if I remember talking to you correctly before. <laughs> I try. With people I can, with relationships I can. Um, think back through, I'm sorry. Okay, we'll get it afterwards. Think back through when people came over to your house, did your parents tell you to speak or not? Did you feel comfortable talking to strangers or not? Strangers are in an appropriate context, of course. When they had the school plays at school, did you have a part? Did you want a part? Did you do well in your part? When you kept participating in activities in school, were you on the student council? Did you have to give a f and give presentations? What you'll find is there may be points when you clammed up or not. There may be times when you were so scared and you still haven't really gotten over that fear. One of the things that I realized, and this really helped me, is some people think that you're born with the ability to communicate, and I think that's nonsense. I think if you want to run as fast as Hussein Bolt, you have to be born with that ability. I think some people are born with a preference for practicing communication more. When I started going through my own notes and trying to realize, huh, people say I can be funny sometimes. Where did I learn how to be funny? I realized when I was in the fifth grade and HBO used to play the same thing over and over and over again, I watched Bill Cosby himself until I knew every single word. And I guess my teacher knew I knew every single word. And then one time she asked me to recite it for class because she didn't have a lesson plan. And I did Bill Cosby himself the entire hour. <laughs> it was awesome. And then I realized, like, you know, people tell me that I can act things out. Where did I learn this? I'm like, I just liked movies from the beginning. I ran around acting like I was Indiana Jones growing up. And then when I saw A Few Good Men, I acted like I was Jack Nicholson. And that's where I picked this stuff up. And some of the difficulties with speech giving came from the same place, like crying. I mean, guys aren't supposed to cry. I feel embarrassed when I cry. And so my original goal was solely to make it clear why I was crying. And it was like I was mining for ore and a gold deposit fell off the wall. Because if you put in proper context why you're crying, other people start crying too. And then that's something I didn't even think could happen. But I think if you go through that oral history, you'll find some issues that you're still pushing through. And you'll realize there are problems for you when you stand up to speak. And you just have to come up with devices that force you to get through it. And the more you do that, the more comfortable it will get for you over time. Does that help? I hope that helps. Is that it? Can we have one more? One more question? I want, the, I want one more, the most awesome question of the day, last question. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's why I said it after you started raising your hand. <laughs> Have you noticed? <clears throat> I'm from the practice of speech. I still find that I'm reminded of the speech. Yeah. 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 Right. Something would be, I'm sorry. It just goes right out. You would have a big problem as a speaker if you didn't get nervous that way. There's an emotional energy in a room when you're giving a speech. There's an emotional energy whenever you're talking. I don't mean to sound new age. Maybe this is new age, but I know it's real. I know, I know like when I was in middle school, if, you know, I, I, I really liked this girl. And I think she liked me. And I knew what I was going to say when it came to, hey, you want to dance MC Hammer? Like, I had it all worked out what we were going to say. <laughs> and then when I got over there, ah, God, I couldn't remember exactly what, it was gonna, what, is, what was gonna supposed to happen. The same thing happens when you're up in front of an audience speaking. That's why I say it's a rough draft until you give it to an audience. And the only way to correct that, and this is why the speech contest is so great. We joined Toastmasters not because we have a lot of spare time, but because we're scared about public speaking. And we go to our Toastmasters club, and at first, we're scared to give speeches in our club. But then you become friends with all the people in your club. And you're just standing up, talking in front of a room full of your friends. To get better, you've got to go talk in front of people that you don't know who make you feel nervous and scared that way. And you keep pushing through it, and pushing through it, and pushing through it. And over time, you know what it's like? Did you play high school football? Did you play any sports at all growing up? Boxer. You're, you're a boxer. A boxer's perfect. That's just as good. Because you have combinations you're supposed to throw. When you get in the ring, your opponent is not going to cooperate with you throwing your combos. <laughs> Are they? They're not going to stand there and get hit. So you have this whole strategy worked out, and it doesn't work. And you start getting hit. And you have to keep fighting, and you adjust. You do that over and over again with lots of different opponents under lots of different circumstances. 
and eventually you get a sense of how it's supposed to work. I can tell you I still get nervous almost every time. I was nervous about my presentation today. Hopefully it went well. I'm nervous. I was nervous every stage during the speech contest. I get nervous every time. I wonder if it's going to go right every single time. When I walked out on the stage for the, for the World Championships, and I know I'm going to wrap it up, when I walked out on the stage, I was, I was this close to taking the helmet and the goggles. I was this close to just taking them off and throwing them down and giving the speech without them, especially after that guy rattled my nerves. I was this close to doing it, and I won the thing. So I, I think the nervousness is a good thing. I think it makes you a better, more humble, more lovable speaker. I think it's harder if you're arrogant and you have to find a way to get rid of that. So nervous energy, it's a good thing. It's going to make you a better speaker. And the only way to learn how to control it is to just get, keep up there, get up there and keep doing it, man. That it's, just, it's school of hard knocks on this one. And you know that based on your work as a boxer. So I'll stick around for a couple minutes. Anybody else have any questions? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.